Praise the Lord. If I don't bless you, ain't none will. I tell you, they could be on the street singing. In the wrong place, that is. Praise God, they're in the house of the Lord. And look at the impact. Somebody said, well, Brother Brown brought a crowd with him. Preacher is telling Brother Pitt that, you know, trying to rub it in a little bit. And I said, well, that's because the band's here tonight. Amen. <laughs> so, so we really appreciate y'all coming and, and sharing with us in song. We, man, we're grateful. I know y'all are here for your youth. I, man, and let me say something about the youth this week. Man, they've been filling up this row every night, praise the Lord. Give them a hand, church. Every night they've been here. And... Uh, that don't happen everywhere. I mean, I know Brother Pitt may share this with you. I don't know if it's probably the same way. We preach revivals in different churches, and there's some churches not got one young person in it. Matter of fact, a few, well, probably months ago now, we preached in a country church way out in the country, and I'm country. I'm thankful for it. Amen. But anyway, we preached that night, and there was a handful there, not a one young, and, and I told them that young, and see there, I told you I was country. But, uh, but, but that evening I said, when we got down, I said, man, at the end of my sermon, I said, you ought to go out and get beat the bushes, get young people in this church. I'm telling you, the church, not only tomorrow, but also today, yeah. I'm thankful they can lead services such as this tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is so good. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to Joshua, the book of Old Testament book of Joshua chapter 3. I know some of you is wondering probably this week, well, does the preacher believe in the Old Testament? Amen, I believe in the Old Testament. I believe it's part of the Bible. You know, you got some of these religious nuts say you ought not to read the Old Testament. You didn't know that, did you? Yeah. They bought everywhere. Uh, I heard the old, old holiness preacher told me the other day, he said, you know, we really don't like you wearing them short sleeve shirts, or some of them don't, you know. He said, you got them religious nuts and ever." Uh, organization or ever church that is or denomination he said you know there was one man he said uh, he, he ended up falling in one of them old open wells and said when he fell down there that's where he met Jesus brother Petty said he got saved and said that man when he got up out of that well he said he started preaching everywhere that listen here he said you got to you got to fall in a well in order to get saved <laughs> I mean, I, I say that to say this. Uh, they some that uh, they believe the Old Testament is not part of the Bible. I'm thankful to God we got all 66 books of the Bible. And the Apostle Paul told Timothy that all Scripture is given of inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine. Ain't that good? Uh, the Bible teaches us in the New Testament that all the Old Testament is mere examples for you and I. So there's something we can learn from the book of Joshua. Matter of fact, Joshua is one of my favorite books in the Old Testament. We look at that very name Joshua and we see that Joshua means salvation. It's Yahweh, Jehovah, meaning salvation. We, we look at Joshua's life and he's really, literally given us a picture of that Jesus Christ which, is, which was to come at that time. But thank God we know he's here now. But anyway, I want to preach to you on this subject tonight. New ground. New ground, that's a catching little phrase there, catching uh, introduction to this sermon, but we get it from Joshua chapter 3, where the Bible says we have not passed this way before. Before we jump into the scripture, I'd heard about these two individuals, that uh, two friends that went golfing, and they was out on the golf course, and they was hitting the ball back and two, and uh, it ended up, I think, like hole nine over in Appling County Golf Course. It's right by the main highway. Said they hit the ball, chipped it up on the green, and all of a sudden one of them was fixing to put it in. And they looked up, and here went a funeral possession. And all of a sudden, that guy that was fixing to chip the ball in, he just bowed down on his knee, and he grabbed his golf club, he took his hat off, and there he just, out of respect, waited on the hearse and all of that funeral possession to go by. And his good friend looked at him and he was just shocked. He was in awe. And he said, uh, man, I've never seen something so moving before. He said, I, I mean, I've never seen nothing like this before. You stopped, you, you out of respect, you didn't hit the golf ball. And he looked at, it, at him and he said, well, I figured that was the least I could do being as I was married to her for 30 years. <laughs> You know, I, I know that's funny, but I share that story to tell you this. It's like there's a lot of Christians that have been married for so long, or should I say, a spouse to the Lord Jesus Christ, 
engage even further than that in the Lord Jesus making that profession of faith in Him saying that we've been born again and there we find ourselves uh, in the situation where this is the least I can do for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about Christians uh, who have been born again, who have been washed, they profess to be washed in the blood of Calvary, living their life for the Lord Jesus Christ, but yet uh, there is no movement in their life. In other words, they're stale, they're stagnant. Just let me give you the terms tonight. They need a Holy Ghost revival. I like saying this in the church from time to time. We need a double dose of the Holy Ghost is what we need. And see here, uh, there's a lot of Christians right there. They don't move. Let me tell you something. I, I preached through the book of Thessalon 1 Thessalonians, been still there uh, today on Sunday mornings, and, and I begin to share with the church. And let me tell you something. When we come to faith in Christ, God is not satisfied uh, just with one step of faith. Can I get a witness in here? Man, God wants to see us walk. He wants us, to, he wants us to take him by the hand and he with us by the hand and walk us in this journey of faith. When we've been born again, that is the very first step. Praise God. If you're here and you've never received Jesus Christ, you need to be born again. You need to be born from above by the very Spirit of Almighty God. You need to make that commitment to say, here is my life, Lord. Take me and let it be. Maybe there's some who has been here all week. You know without a shadow of a doubt that you've never had this change in your life. I, I, I just, when I think about new ground, I think about that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is in the business of doing. Amen? Taking something that's old and wretched and blind and filthy and no good, dead, and, and bringing it to life. I'm talking about giving us something new. Don't you like new things? I love new things. I believe you're a liar and the truth ain't in you if you don't like new things. I believe that's the way God designed it. I, I think about what the Apostle Paul said all through the Scripture, thinking about new, talking about new ground, new things. I think about what Paul said. He said, all old things have passed away. And all things have become new. He's made us a new creation in Christ Jesus. We ought to never lose sight of that. We are a new individual when we come to Christ. And, and when we look here in the Scripture, we, uh, we see that uh, uh, where we're at, or actually before this, to kind of give us a setting, uh, we know that the children of God were there in bondage in Egypt. The Bible teaches us that, that God sent them a, a deliverer, did He not? I was sitting there thinking about it a while ago. How God sent the children of Israel a deliverer. He raised up that miraculous birth of Moses and saved him there through the bulrush. And, and God took that Moses there and, and, and He able, enabled him to lead the children of Israel out of that bondage. When we look at Egypt, we know that represents uh, that natural person. It represents that lost individual. It represents that, uh, that person that is dead in their trespasses and sins as the Apostle Paul said. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about church? I'm talking about that life. That Listen, we live our life uh, not even a choice to sin. That's just who we are. We dead in our trespasses and sins. So what we need is we need a change. Amen. We need a new life. We need to be quickened by the very Spirit of Almighty God. God's still doing that today, by the way. He's making old things new. He's bringing us alive. So God took Moses there and he led them children of Israel. Moses representing, by the way, uh, the law that God had give. Uh, and there Moses led them all the way through the uh, wilderness wanderings. You know the story. God said, listen now, I'm taking you to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. I'm talking about I'm taking you to a land that you've never ever uh, been to before. I've got it prepared for you. <laughs> and see there uh, they, out of their disbelief, just simply, out of their disbelief, they did not make it in to the promised land. Uh, we see only Joshua, uh, which we're reading tonight, and Caleb, those men at 85 years old, said, God said it, and we can do it, praise the Lord. Uh, God enabled them to go, but all of those children in disbelief, they died there in that wilderness. Man, I'm, I'm afraid that there's going to be a lot of, listen now, a lot of carnal Christians. You uh, Do you believe in a carnal Christian? Christian? The Apostle Paul said that we could be carnal Christians and there's a lot who are living below that victorious life in which God has called us to live. Uh, they stuck out in the wilderness. Well here we're here to tell you tonight that there's some new ground that you can step on. Do you believe that? 
See, you got to believe it before we can go any further. Amen? You really, you got to believe it. You got to believe it and realize that God wants to take you a place that you have never been. I'm talking, I don't care if you're Methodist. I don't care if you're Baptist. I don't care if you're here and you're Pentecostal tonight. God wants to take you to higher ground. Amen? He wants to take you somewhere that you've never treaded. He wants to take you somewhere that you've never set eyes on what you're about to see. He wants to take you somewhere that you would never imagine that you would ever been. Do you know what I'm talking about, church? If you don't, I pray that you get there tonight because God, listen now, God has a new ground, a new place prepared for us. And here is what we learn. Look what the Bible says in chapter 3 and verse 4. I'll read it to you here. He says, Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. He said, Come near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. Here it is. He said, For ye have not passed this way before. Listen to me, young people. Uh, when I begin to look over this, uh, this, uh, this passage of Scripture before, I think even tonight about those new territories that God took me. Can I tell you, I used to be your age. I mean, that's a, it don't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. I used to be your age. Everybody in here did, amen? Uh, and that is, some may be younger than you, but I remember all the way back in my life when I was uh, coming up through elementary school at Patterson Elementary. And uh, we was out off of Tire Bridge Road. I'm telling you, some of these stories for a purpose here, but I remember in that first grade, I was a bashful little character. You hear me? You'd never believe it, would you? I'm telling you, I was a bashful character. I didn't like to say a whole lot. I was the one that was always over here, a little quiet, you know. But uh, anyway, there in the first grade, I remember going from that first grade class over to that new elementary school at Patterson Elementary and how they come and got us on that bus. And I remember one day in particular that uh, first day of kindergarten, we went half a day and I rode the short bus, praise the Lord. You'd never believe it. But we went a half a day, and I remember Mama saying, wait out there by that pole to a certain place. That's the kind of person I was now. I mean, wait out there at that pole, and your sister's going to uh, see you there at such and such time. She's going to get you on the right bus. And my sister never did show, Brother Pat. Scared me to death. I mean, I left there squalling. But anyway, uh, I remember moving that school to the next. I remember going from the elementary school to the junior high school into this big prison at Pierce County High School where I got my Ph.D., I think about moving from uh, there to, uh, you know, all the way to graduate in 1994. Already been 20 years. But I, I look back on my life and I, I literally, man, it's awesome to see where God had his hand on me. I'm telling you, man, he was keeping me. He was just showing me things that I, I've never, ever seen before. I was doing things I never know why I was doing. I, mean, I was taking computer. Here I am, a vocational man. You know, I liked FFA. I like showing hogs and, and cows and all this kind of stuff. Why are you tell us all this. I didn't know what God had prepared for me, but God was looking ahead. He knew where he was taking me, and I tell you still to this day, God knows where he's taking me, and I'm trusting him all the way. God has a new place for you, young people. Let me tell you something, but it don't go just with you. He's got a new place we've never seen with New Vision Methodist Church. You hear me? I got it right then. Amen? You ain't New Vision Baptist like I told you Sunday night. New Vision Methodist Church, God's got a place where you've never been before. I'm talking about where, where the sky's the limit. Oh, we, ain't, we think God is contained in a box. He ain't in no box. We think God's contained in a day. I'm so grateful to God on a Wednesday night this place is packed out. Amen? God ain't contained in no day. God ain't contained in no box or a building, my friend. God is God and He is a big God and He's got a big place He wants to take us. I know, I know without a shadow of a doubt that heaven is that final resting place. I know that. I know we got some, you know, I mean, we need to, man, we need to be like the Apostle Paul. <laughs> he said, I run as yet like I have not yet attained. He said, if anybody be mature, let him be like-minded. We ain't made it yet. And he said he's running, he's giving everything he's got. He's in this race and he's got his eyes on heaven. He said, I have... He said, my, uh, my goal is, is heaven. He says that high uh, mark, that calling in Christ Jesus. Man, I got my eyes on heaven. But the apostle Paul, he was a goal-oriented man. And bless God, he was willing to do any and everything to reach that goal. That's how we ought to be. God's got something better for us. Don't he, Aaron? I see it in your life, Aaron. Aaron just started preaching, praise the Lord. 18 years old, he just started preaching. Amen. Some people say, well, he don't spit yet. That's coming. That's coming. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's coming. 
I remember the first time I stood up in the pulpit, and I mean, I can go and tell you about these new things. Man, I stood up there and I listened to the tape. We had, still had the cassette tape, and I listened to that thing. I'm like, do what? Man, I was like a, a weak little liberal up there preaching. I was like, man, that was me. But man, God's got a better place for us. Again, take us where we've never been. And I, I just want to tell you how you can get there tonight. You ready for this? I'm ready for this journey tonight. I'm telling you, it might be a long one. You ready for the long one? Oh, amen. I'm telling there is, there is a way that we can get there. And I believe it's laid out in the scripture. Nothing, nothing, listen, nothing polished. Just straight from the word of God. I, I, I want to read it to you here. The Bible says in chapter 3, in verse 1, Joshua rose up early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and, and came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel lodged there before they passed over. And it, it came to pass after three days. I've shared this many a time in the pulpit at Spring Branch, but three days, what does that represent? Man, there's a big picture right here. Three days represents a couple of things. Number one, it represents death. See, we look in the Bible, we, we see that a uh, few times we, we see that three days. We look in, uh, in the book of Jonah, we see where this rebellious prophet run from God. And, and the Bible says that he was in the belly of the well for three days. What does that represent? Well, Jonah said it was just like hell. Amen. I mean, it was in the outer darkness. It was in a place way away from God. People focus on that well and how he could he'd be big, big enough to swallow this man. But the, the, here's, the, here's the thing. It's not the well that we concerned about swallowing that man, what was on the inside that well, but it was what was on the inside that man wants to be concerned about, amen? That's what God was concerned about. There was something going on inside that prophet. But anyway, death, that's what it's a picture of. Three days, here God, uh, Joshua said uh, in chapter 1, verse 11, said, prepare your victuals, get up there uh, to the Jordan. We're going to pass over in three days. There was a reason for that. Because when they got to this Jordan, which was overflowing the banks during the harvest time of the year, it was like they knew they could not get across it. It was, it was unhuman. I mean, it was like there's no way that we can get across the Jordan. And so God was putting them there for three days to look at something that was just impossible that they could do. So then we learned that not only does three days represent death, it represents resurrection. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, we think about death. Well, let me back up a little bit. Jesus in the grave for three days. Hallelujah. But uh, after those three days, uh, it also represents resurrection. Because Jonah, let me tell you something. He got on his knees. Oh, he went down to Joppa. He went down in the well. He went down in the bottom of the sea. But hallelujah, when he prayed to the Lord God Almighty and repented, oh, that old well spit him up on dry land. And he run, he run just as fast as he could to Nineveh to preach the gospel to them people and there they repented and got saved, turned turn their, uh, turn their uh, uh, lives back to God Almighty and then we see the Lord Jesus Christ after that third day, he resurrected from the dead, hallelujah, and he ever lives and I believe that's the reason uh, Joshua had took them uh, to the brink of the Jordan and said three days uh, uh, that we're going to pass over. Now in verse 3 he says this, here's our first point we're getting in the body right here they commanded the people saying, When ye shall see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, he said, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place. Here it is. You got it, out? You got it open right here? Circle it. He said, go after it. Did you see that? Oh, you, you must not be in here with me. I mean, are y'all here tonight? Did you hear what he said? He said, when you see the Ark of the Covenant, he said, go after it. What is he meaning, preacher? Well, I'm glad you asked because, I mean, it is vitally important what he's meaning here when he says to go after it. To go after the Ark of the Covenant. What is the Ark of the Covenant? What is it symbolic of? What is he meaning here? Well, it was like this. The Bible says that these children of Israel had to take this Ark of the Covenant with them. These priests was to bear that Ark upon their shoulders. And, and what was inside of that Ark is tremendously important. And I believe is one of the first things we need to realize uh, when we talk about discovering this new territory, getting this place that we've never been. Number one, we see inside that Ark... Uh, there was found uh, what, uh, what is known as to be the two tablets of stone, which is the Ten Commandments. That was on the inside of that Ark of the Covenant. 
Well, what, what does it mean to have the Ten Commandments in here? Well, the children of God was to be reminded of the law that God had given them. Now, let me tell you something. We live in a day and age where the law of God, I mean, it's like everybody says, well, the law of God don't mean nothing to us no more. Well, let me tell you something. I know Jesus Christ came to fulfill every law which was written. Don't get me wrong. But the Bible teaches us that God give us a law for a purpose. The law was for our own good. The law is for our own protection. Now, I'm not talking about going over there in the book of Leviticus and finding yourself doing every law which was written that God written down uh, for the, uh, through this old covenant. I'm not talking about that. But when we look at the Ten Commandments, they're written for our good. I tell you, one of those things we're reminded of is that we needed a Savior. Amen? We all acknowledge that, that God give us a law to recognize that, man, we need a Savior. We need a power other than the power that we have in ourselves in order to live this Christian life. Yes, I said it. I'm Baptist and I said it. We need the power of Almighty God within us, that power being the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost of God coming to live within us in order for us to live this Christian life. We cannot do it on our own. We can't. Some people say, well, we just need to turn over a new leaf. No, we don't need to turn over a new leaf. We need a transformation. We need a regeneration. We need to be born again by the very Spirit of Almighty God. I tell you where it takes place. It takes place at Calvary because when we acknowledge, when we come to ourselves and say, Oh, I need a Savior. I can't do this on my own. And we find ourselves at Calvary saying, Oh Lord, thank you for what you did on that cross was for every sin that I would ever commit. I ain't talking about part of them. I'm talking about every one of them. I'm talking about to cleanse us from all sin. <laughs> Some people find that hard to believe. But that's the loving Savior we got. He died for every sin. I'm talking about every sin that we would ever commit. Some people say, our God did that? I'm telling you, that's where liberation takes place. That's what the law cannot do. You hear me? People standing at the law and they're trying to work and earn their way to heaven. I tell you, you'll find yourself in a devil's hell because you'll never earn your way. You'll get to that point where you say, I need a Savior. I need Jesus Christ. That's every one of us. I'm telling you, the most miserable place to be is trying to work your way to heaven. You cannot do it. You can't do it. Oh, but when the Lord comes to live within, I tell you, He'll give you a new perspective on all things. Amen? I'm telling you, he'll make you look at sin different. He'll make you look at life different. Amen. He'll make you look at yourself different. He'll make you look at your church different. Amen. He'll make you look at everybody else different. That's what our Savior will do. The law is a tutor. Amen. To help us along the way, but Jesus is our Savior. These people had to be reminded. I think of 1 John every time I think about the law. The Bible says, let me turn over there to says in 1 John chapter 2, says this, uh, Hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Let me tell you something. There's not only commandments in the Old Testament. If you look over the New Testament, there's more com commandments. Do what? I didn't know that. Yeah. There's commandments all in the New Testament. Jesus gave them to us. Love ye one another. Amen. Uh, we'll talk about adultery, murder, and everything else, but we'll skip love. And that's the main thing Jesus said. He said, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, might, and soul. Hang every one of the Ten Commandments on these, every one of the law and the prophets, he said. He said, and not only love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, might, and soul, this is the greatest commandment. He said, second of this is to love thy neighbor as thyself. Oh, all men will know you're my disciples for the love you have one for another. There's commandments all in the Word of God. There's a commandment to be baptized. You know that? Oh, y'all like this. I'm telling you, I'm just ignorant when it comes to different nominations and all. And I walked in the Asbury Methodist Church here. Hadn't been long ago. Y'all appreciate this. I know you will. Because you know me by now after three or four nights. I like to have fun. I'm like your pastor. Anyway, the lady was showing me around in the church. And, and uh, I was looking around. I said, man, it's a beautiful place. Beautiful place you got. And I looked around. And I said, where's your baptistry? And she bumped me and she said, it's a Methodist church. I said, I was just kidding. And then I come here, see a lot of y'all ain't laughing because I come here and I seen a baptistry up here. I said, hallelujah. This Methodist church, this Methodist church has got it right. Amen. 
I'm telling you, you ever seen a, a, a man sprinkled to death? <laughs> Never. <laughs> He's got to be submerged, amen? <laughs> <laughs> submerged means you never come up and some of them I want to take under and never come up amen <laughs> makes me think about that man he said he, he went down he said he went down he said I'm baptized in the name of the Father he held him under for a while and he started breaking a little bit and he came up with him he said you see Jesus he said no so he went under with him again he said he said have you seen Jesus yet he had him a little bit longer and he come up and he said no not yet <laughs> And he said he went under the third time and I mean he held him under he was kicking and he was about to I mean just you know He's about to really die. And uh, he pulled him back up. He said, he said, you see Jesus that time? He said, he said, no, but if you do it again, I probably will. <laughs> I'm telling you, where was I at? <laughs> Lord help me. Ten commandments. We need a Savior. Not only in this Ark of the Covenant was the two tablets, but also there was a supernaturally preserved pot of manna. What in the world does that mean? It reminded those children of Israel every day of their life. Let me tell you something. That God was the satisfier of their soul. He was everything that they needed. He was going to meet every need which they have. Oh, how we need to be reminded of that today. A supernaturally preserved pot of manna. Jesus said, I am the bread of the life. I think of that woman in Samaria where she went to draw water and Jesus said, if you had asked, I'd have give you water springing up into eternal life. You would have never, ever thirsted again. I love that. That fountain of life. He's talking about that eternal life. I believe uh, that here the supernaturally preserved pot of manna reminded them that God was the one who would satisfy. But there was something else in there. There was a budding rod. That, that supernatural budding rod that laid in that was always there. It reminded them, hallelujah, that God is a miracle working God. Do you believe that? Amen. They some don't today. But I'm glad to know I'm one of them that believes that God's a miracle working God still. Amen. He never changes. People change, but He never changes. I thought about several that God had done a miracle in their life. I thought about one in particular. We was preaching one night at Spring Branch. Now, this just thrills me to death. I get, I mean, I never forget things like this. We preached on God moving that mountain. I've said this. My people's heard this a million times because that's how much it means to me. And, man, we preached that night, Brother Pat, and here come a dear brother. Ain't been at Spring Branch that long, probably a year or two. Ended up joining him and his wife. And, brother, he, he come up back. He come up very broken to the front. You know, we was doing the invitation and, and, and uh, had deacons lined up all the way around or down the front. And, and uh, he come up and he had, he had a, his box of cigarettes and a lighter. No offense if you smoke in here. It never says you're going to go to hell because you smoke. Don't go smoke now. But, but he brought that cigarette in the Baptist church. I said, wow. And he handed that thing to me and he said, Preacher, here's my mountain. Here's my mountain. <laughs> I tell you, that boy was delivering cigarettes that day. This is a Christian man I'm talking about. He ain't smoking anymore. He's chewing gum. <laughs> now that's a miracle to me. I'm telling you, that's what the Word of God will do. That's what the Spirit of Almighty God will do. God's not dead. He's alive. I thought about one night we had a revival. Man, we man, went come through our revival. We was preaching revival at Consolation that next week. 14 days straight to church preaching. I'm telling you, I was wore slap out, but I was revived. <laughs> it was just like I, I told somebody, I said, man, I feel so good. I said, I, I, I said I, I'm so full of the Holy Spirit, I can't hardly eat. And that man so wisely said, it could be the other way around. You could be so full of food that you couldn't have no room for the Holy Spirit. I said, wow, it might be what's wrong with us sometime. I like to eat too much. But I remember, amen. I remember we got done with that night service. I was, man, this church is so dead. They got up and sang one song and said, come preach, preacher. I was like, what? We preached for 45 minutes. You wouldn't believe that, would you? 45 minutes. Give the invitation. Shook hands. Went all the way back to Spring Branch. They still having church. Glory to God. Come in, sit in the back. And listen to the preacher preach that night. God ever give the invitation. I'm telling you, God worked a miracle right over on the side. This, this girl's little boy had been having stomach trouble. I'm talking about not going to school. I mean, couldn't go to school. Just having that much trouble. Family issues. We prayed that night, and I'm tell, I believe it. I believe it just short as we was down there. That boy was miraculously healed that night. 
I'm telling you because I've seen it. He comes sit down with me. Did he end up not missing a day of school? No more trouble with his stomach. That same night we left, and I guarantee you 100, 150 head. I'm talking about 8.30 at night. We traveled down that old uh, uh, US-1 and went down this old dirt road in this house. Not much room at all, and I pulled up. Man, they, was, they, was, they had to be 100, 150 head in the, in, the, in the yard. I'm talking about you could hear a pin drop for the respect. And we walked up those steps, went inside, knowing that woman with old that had cancer, Tanya Willoughby's her name, you might know her. And washing her feet with water, she requested the deacons to wash her feet with this water from Israel. We prayed and wept and cried. I'm telling you, just sure as we in this building tonight, that woman's healed. I'm talking about done deal. Some people say, oh, she's still having chemo and all this. Yeah, she's having chemo, but let me tell you something, that woman's healed. She was hallucinating on the bed. Was she not? Hallucinating on the bed. Couldn't even get up. I, that's the miracle work in God that we have. Jesus said, if you believe in me, he said, you'll be able to do things that I did. Well, I looked at the Bible and see what Jesus did. He done a whole lot of great things. And then he said, you'll be able to do greater things even than I. What does that mean? Oh, we'll, we smart too smart for our own good. We'll say, well, he did this here during this time and he done this during this time. Jesus said it will be done. I believe it. Miracles. We don't believe. We don't trust. What we got to lose even if God does take us on? Not a thing. Where was I at? That's still my first point, church. <laughs> there was the budding rod. The supernaturally preserved pot of manna. There was the Ten Commandments. And then on top of that thing, there was a mercy seat. <laughs> and I'm telling you, praise God for the mercy seat. On that mercy seat, the priest would go in there. He would take that hyssop, that blood, and he would, he would offer up that sin, uh, you know, that, that sacrifice for the sins of the people. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness. I'm thankful to God for church that loves and to sing about the blood of Jesus. Amen. Hey, some churches won't even mention the blood. They say, preacher, I was too sick. Amen. Well, let me tell you, without the shedding of blood, you cannot be forgiven. Amen. And there they went in and sprinkled that blood, and that's what it reminds us of. It reminds, it reminds us of the blood that Jesus shed upon that cross for our sin. What do you tell us about all these things? I'm telling you, that very ark and everything inside of that ark you know what it's a picture of? Do you know what it's a rep representation of? It represents our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Sit down, Methodist. Sit down. Did you hear what I just said? Everything in that ark represents our Lord. <laughs> Vic, you know what he's saying? He's saying, church, let me just give you the application of this. He's saying, Get your eyes fixed on Jesus and don't take them off. And you follow him. See, the Bible says there was some 600 and something thousand. If you, some scholars believe that if you, put the, if you put the women and children, there was almost 2 million people that was fixed to cross over that Jordan. And they had to let the ark be way out in front of them. There had to be a distance from it, uh, such distance where everybody could see. Reminds us that Sunday night where everybody couldn't get in there. You know, they couldn't get in there with a man. Crowd and Jesus. Everybody backed off. And they was looking ahead. Church, we got to keep our eyes on Jesus. I remember Jesus telling Nicodemus, he said, has, the, has Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness? He said, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Amen. For whosoever believeth on the name of the Son of God shall have eternal life. What are you saying here? Well, let me just give you a little application, a little visual picture of this. During that time, Moses was told to lift up the serpent, and if they simply looked, if they looked to the serpent, you think about this man and woman, you know, or this little boy running this grown-up, you know. Think about your youth tonight. Man, God can use you for His glory. To tell people about Jesus. Look to Jesus and be saved. This little boy runs to his uh, husband, or, yeah, husband and wife and said, oh, 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 I've heard that all we got to do is go to Moses. Just find him and look up to that serpent and we'll be saved. 
And that little boy ran along and he was telling everybody he could tell and finally he got to that serpent and he looked up and boy, as he looked up, praise God, he was saved. Nothing could touch him. And all of a sudden these people he had told and did not believe, here come along that little snake and psh, bit him. Then he fell over and died. There come along the little snake and bit him. There she or, or her, she fell over and died. All of these other people that just simply did not believe did not make it. But this little boy had enough faith to believe what God said. I'm here to tell you, you got to look to Jesus to be saved. I remember again, I mentioned Charles Spurgeon. They said he walked in that Methodist church. That old layman looked at him. I love it. He said, he said, sir, he said, just look. Just look to Jesus and be saved. And finally God opened up that old Spurgeon's heart and he was a new creature in Christ when he walked out of there. Why? Because he simply looked to Christ. Oh, that ark represents our Lord and Savior. But I want you to see something else. Second of all, how are we going to make it? Well, we've got to look to Jesus. That's simple, preacher. It is. But everybody don't believe that. You've got to believe it. Second of all, he says, look at it in a few verses after this. Actually, one more verse. I love this verse. He says, sanctify yourselves. Look at it. Look at it here. Verse number 5, he says, Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourself. Wow. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Don't you want that? Don't you want to, again, see God do something he ain't ever done? I long for that. I've been reading this, this book by E.W. Tozer, Rut, Rod, Revival. And this is what he, he says. He says, you know how you know you're in a rut and you need revival? And you're in that rut rottening? He said, because, he said, when you, when you figure out that before you get to church Sunday, you know exactly what's going to happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. You walk into church and you're thinking, oh God, I know how today's going to be. You don't come expecting. You ain't been praying during the week. You ain't been seeking God throughout the week. And you're saying, oh Lord, it's going to be a one of them, another one of them boring services. You ain't looking for God to do nothing. He said, you like that, you're in a rut. Man, that, and that, that reminds us that we need to be prayed up, 